Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from four exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. Hi, that's me. Day to you from four exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. Hi, that's me. David. Hey, hey. I'm your host, Fen. Hello. And we are joined today by a new standee, Kara. Hello, Kara. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome, indeed. Would you like to introduce you? Welcome. <laughs> Welcome, indeed. Would you like to introduce yourself uh, to our listeners and tell us a bit about you? Yeah, sure. Um, well, my name is Kara. Um, though online, I'm also known as Kara Playing Stuff because that's what I do when I have time. And um, yeah, apart from stream, where I um, play different things, board games, some video games, sometimes I build brick sets, uh, whatever tickles my fancy. <laughs> um, while not playing, I'm a teacher in high school in Germany. Math, biology, technology. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have someone join the Last Dandy Punch Bolt. Yeah, that's really cool. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Freshly punched out and stuck into a little uh, standee clip, ready to <laughs> to waddle along from side to side. Okay, uh, we're going to be talking about a range of different topics uh, across the hobby. Um, so first of all, I think, uh, David and Nikara, you had some something you wanted to talk about. Yeah, um, basically we have to withdraw our recommendation for Degenitus. That happened actually a few weeks ago. Basically what happened, one of the developers, one of the live question and answers, and basically a few people reacted to it with like, hey, dude, not cool and some stuff like that. However, th there was no apology or anything like that. And given that uh, Degenitus covers a lot of very heavy topics for an RPG game, I think that heavy topics for a RPG game, I think that's not something you should do like in general. Like <laughs> it's not nothing you should do at all. And especially if you have like uh, published such a heavy uh, topic RPG, you shouldn't do it at all. What further happened further happened after that is that uh, the community reacted to it like sometimes in a positive way even. I would say, which is like something I cannot support. And um, yeah, like after three days, uh, the developer offered an apology, like in general, a little too late. And Kara and I, we were like both involved with the Genesis because we made uh, this uh, Mobilis FM podcast, which covers like RPGs in general and the Genesis. And basically, we said like we have to, we will stop this project because we will no longer support the Genesis. And I'm inside the community and with the game itself. And basically, we were banned for for that <laughs> from the from the Discord, which is like crazy because it happened within five seconds after we posted our statements. So yeah, I cannot can no longer rec recommend it because like if this community will become like a main attraction for far-right people and I don't want to have any connection with that. Yeah, it's also not very um, good or responsible of a, of, of a community manager or a company to react the way they did to people saying we're not happy what we're doing and, and so on. And to react the way they did to people saying we're not happy what we're doing and, and so on. Immediately banning people for uh, having a counter opinion or um, being crit critical. Uh, is not not a good way to to behave i think yeah definitely and and like it's it's not only that because um critical uh is not not a good way to to behave i think yeah definitely and and like it's it's not only that because um there is a small difference between moderators and members of the team behind behind the genesis and of course behind the genesis and of course we were banned by a moderator on the discord um without an explanation by the way um i would have expected them to i don't know write a message so hey i banned you because um and i wrote an email to um, the creators um, after this happened and um, i admit i wasn't very friendly in my email because i was pretty 
test <laughs> and um, their reaction was basically them distancing themselves from the Discord and their moderators and saying, well, if you have a problem, you have to deal with the community. We don't have anything to do with this. And, um, and I think that shows a kind of lack of awareness um, of their influence and their responsibility as um, content creators for their, which they um, created themselves. I mean, it's not like a community discord. Um, we do have community discords for some board games, but this is a discord that was created by them for the community. And then I don't think they can just say, eh, it's got nothing to do with us. <laughs> Basically what, uh, what's even more like, uh, to make the situation worse, like the person who banned us, uh, is a moderator who works for, uh, six more vodka for, for the company behind the Genesis. And also the dev who posted, this is like works works for them obviously so basically uh, saying that they don't have any responsibility with the community discord is not true uh, i think that what's also very important is that in any community like that if you allow people to make those kind of jokes it kind of hardline nazi sympathizer yeah if you allow one uh nazi to sit in your bar and you just don't mind then very quickly it will become a nazi bar that's just how it functions that's a very uh, yeah, famous analogy that one yeah if you you have somebody and you own an establishment and you have something then then they may bring their friend in and then the friend will start behaving that way and before you know it all of a sudden you're no longer um in charge of your establishment instead it's run by the people who and their views and you may get um uh radicalized yourself yeah and and the p the people that have people that are your uh, real target demographic, they might move away because they don't want to be associated with, in this ca case, uh, far-right dickheads. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult because it's a very exhausting conversation to have with um, people who are uh, radicalized on, who are, uh, radicalized on any, um, any particular thing. Because it's it's hard work to get back to them, you know. I've had family members become radicalized by a cult, and um, it it was impossible. It was absolutely. We just had to uh, disassociate ourselves from them because of associate ourselves from them because of because of all of that. Luckily, they came around and eventually moved on and saw what was going on and was like, "Oh, geez, but like, why didn't you help?" We were like, "We tried. We tried." But we, you know, we couldn't get through. So yeah, it's a. Uh, I I'm of the position and opinion now that you you have to draw a hard line in the sand and just say you you have to draw a hard line in the sand and just say no, you 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 can't you you can't be okay with that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's pretty much what we what we did. Um, personally, I think like I don't think the like the degenerates deaths are like far right. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is they are enabling other, but what I'm saying, what I'm saying is they are enabling other people that might come to the community to post such things. And uh, at the same time, people who like are like more moderate will like get turned away from the, from the, um, from the community and from the community. And uh, Degenesis already has like some kind of reputation problem, and that thing will certainly make it worse. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, it's it's an ongoing conversation on many fronts, and I feel like within the board gaming and role playing space, uh, this is going to be something we're going to deal with more big. Yep, like actually, we, for our mobilist podcast, we always uh, we got like some giveaway directly from the developers like 10 books worth 1000 euros we sent them back as well so like we were like ready to build up a proper community with them like as a community effort but uh, i don't want to be part of the community if it looks like this in the future yeah me neither yeah very understandable so it's unfortunate um but yeah that's, uh, we'll have to withdraw our recommendation of Digenesis from uh, some previous. Our recommendation of Digenesis from 
some previous podcast recordings um, and move on. So shall we talk about some other things? Yeah. Yes. Please. Right. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Where are we at? All right. Uh, so uh, for myself, I've uh, I've been playing a bunch of different um, and other things. Uh, so after um, the announcement from Cephalo Fair, I, I, as I mentioned before, about uh, Frosthaven. Um, I got in through somebody else who'd cancelled their pledge. Thank you very much, whoever did that. Uh, the six new starting classes have been announced. Uh, they're pretty cool, the species, you know, basing them on like uh, uh, real world stereotypes and, and so on. Like the Inox Drifter is very cool and came from a few sort of questions along that line. So that's a great example of where creating limitations that you're going to stick within um, to try and avoid the past cre- enhances creativity. Um, I, for one, am super excited about playing the Harrower Germinate. I really like the Harrowers, and um, I was always sad you couldn't play one as a starting character in any of the previous uh, Gloomhavens, so that's pretty exciting. In um, not so happy news, in, um, not so happy news, my Burgle Bros minis arrived. They're great. Um, but the thing about Burgle Bros is these were like part of the Burgle Bros 2 Kickstarter. Um, and I knew this when I was getting them, but it was still like a bit sad to actually see it. They're intended and labeled to be for use with intended and labeled to be for use with Burgle Bros and Burgle Bros 2. They're clearly just for like Burgle Bros 1 characters. Um, the characters, are, the actual characters are the same through each of the three, um, each of the games, and including in Sabotage as well, they're the same characters, the Juicer and so on, the Raven, the Rook, but Raven, the Rook, but they have different outfits. I was hoping that we would see the casino outfits for some of these characters, because the casino art looks amazing, but it's clearly just Burgle Bros 1 in their burglary outfits, and even the um, guards are security guards, which is Burgle Bros 1, because Burgle Bros 2, their bodyguards still gorgeous miniatures, um, but they are very much for Burgle Bros 1 if you want to exactly match the artwork on the card, which I find tends to help. That's a bit unfortunate. Yeah, um, I've also been playing uh, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. Might well have a conversation about that in the future because it's, it's a nice, great tool for people who want to play role playing as in investigative role playing because one of the Big problem. I run a lot of investigative role-playing stuff, and the biggest problem I have is players holding to their chest what they've learned, and they refuse to speak to anyone because they're afraid of talking to like a villain. Um, huh. Whereas when you like a villain, um, huh. whereas when you, when you look at like the Sherlock Holmes cases and and classic uh, investigative tropes, almost always during the story, the hero, the lead, the investigator will run into. Um, the villain at some point because otherwise the villain comes out of nowhere and it's very unsatisfying so this is a great tool of like very unsatisfying so this is a great tool of like going through and learning the investigative steps and meeting people catching them in lies and so on and then you feel like a completely useless individual at the end when Sherlock Holmes turns up and goes, oh, well, you took, what, 13 leads to complete your case, did you? Oh, well, you took, what, 13 leads to complete your case, did you? That's nice, I did it in four. With these ridiculous <laughs> leaps in logic and deductions and all sorts of things that even if you followed the four leads I went through, nope, you wouldn't be able to come to the same conclusion that I did. But that's Sherlock Holmes for you, especially this one. So, but that's Sherlock Holmes for you especially this one so it, it's it's enjoyable and you can actually still beat him even though he uh basically plot forces his way through everything you know um they're brilliantly written brilliant and very enjoyable that sounds very interesting i usually lo- it plays out on, on deduction and, and logic it sounds yeah. very interesting maybe it's we... like should give it a try sometime. We should. It, it's on Tabletop Simulator. Um, it's very much like the birth of the Spiral Board Game Paragraph book. Um, speaking of which, I've been playing another one. It's right here. Um, demo book from um, uh, the Kickstarter, which is out. Uh, well, it'll be late pledging available. I'm going to do a written review on it. Um, this is It's from 3D Art Lab. Uh, Marcus Geiger. Um, he kind of he was kind of to send it to me, and I do just want to me, 
And I do just want to like right now say this is this is really innovative, unusual and amazing. Like it's it's something new in the board game space. It's a real evolution um, in the way that like Awkward Guests, which I talked about before was, you know, we like I, I said how Awkward Guests has this incredible card system, which you guest has this incredible card system, which gives you millions of different cases to solve. This has like a different form of innovation, but it's the same way. It's just as exciting and you can back for the PDF copy only which is he's put such an affordable price on there that I I don't know why everybody who plays board games is why everybody who plays board games isn't at least backing for that much just to see how unusual this is how beautiful the artwork is and um, yeah space kraken I got to give it two thumbs up and I'm trying to get to a written review on it because I think it's that good yeah awesome uh, I'm looking forward to to talk about you uh, maybe in uh, one of our next episodes yeah, sometime a bit further down the line when I've played through it a few times. It's got a number of different story thread plots you follow and uh, takes you in a lot of different directions and stuff. So I'm trying to see what the replayability is like on it. But as a, even as a one-off experience, like for about nine euros, I think it is, or they've been up to. Uh, what about you guys? Um, Alexis, what have you been doing? Uh, I haven't been doing that much. I've been visiting the family a little bit. So uh, I've played some Project L again with my mom and my sister. Uh, still a very fun game to, to play that way. Uh, and I would love to, to talk to them about it. Uh, I've, uh, I've also been trying uh, Not Alone, which is a very small board game. I think it's originally French. Uh, or maybe even Belgian. I'll need to, to check that out uh, because I, I met the, the creators at a, a con uh, a couple of years back. Um, met the, the creators at a, a con uh, a couple of years back. Um, and it's sort of a um, predator type game where one player play as... Um, uh, hunting monster and the other the hunting monster and the other the other player play as a team as um, shipwrecked uh, character on an alien planet and they try to hide in different environments while the hunter uh, is going to pick a uh, select few location to uh, either uh, search through or like lay down a trap or something it's it's very interesting as a, a hunter hunty mechanics um i've yet to play enough of it to to talk more uh to, to talk about it more but um so far pretty interesting They're not alone and uh, so the game is on my shelf so i'm just going to read the name by uh, geek attitude games all right and um Otherwise, uh, nothing much. I played Red Cathedral with um, Karen Fenn which, uh, and Audrey. Uh, we'll talk about that. A bit. And um, I'm going to have my vaccine later today. So at one point, I will disappear from the recording and <laughs> uh, I will go uh, turn myself into a magnetic being um, hooked onto the hive mind. I hope you get 5G installed as well. I know. I really hope I, I... firmware upgrade after after the installation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, how about you, Kara? Uh, what have you been uh, doing since the last time that you didn't happy on the podcast? <laughs> well, uh, let's start thirty-two years ago. No. Um, well, I fought with uh, grass pollen. Um, I'm an uh, allergic and. The last two days were very bad, but um, apart from that, uh, last weekend I actually played a lot of Tsukuyumi. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the game and um, King Raccoon Games. They um, made a small tournament and I actually won. And now I'm technically the world champion in Tsukuyumi because this is the only Tsukuyumi tournament in the world. <laughs> so. <laughs> I mean, only four people played, but <laughs> still tech. And um, yeah, apart from that, I um, I'm really getting into to building bricks right now. Uh, just today, I went to the post office and got a delivery, and um, yeah, looking forward to that. 
and also to starting Sleeping Gods finally. Um, it's standing right behind me in my shelf and I haven't gotten around to trying it out yet, but I've heard a lot of good things. That's amazing. We, we've, we've, we're going to be having a <laughs> we're going to be having a bit of a discussion on that one once everyone's caught up a bit on it because yeah it's uh... yeah. Apart from that, um, I haven't met anyone in real life in like eight months because of COVID. So um, I yeah, I didn't get around to really play with people uh, physically and um, played a lot of solo games um, in my stream. Uh, for example, um, Stuffed Fables, and um, that was interesting for me, trying uh, all my solo games. But I'm looking forward to finally playing with other people again in Stone Tabletop Simulator. I think we yeah. all do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Um, I've We've been socially distant since moving to the Gotland here. Um, and that was a year ago, January. Um, not entirely, because um, since moving to the Gotland here, um, and that was a year ago, January. Um, not entirely, because um, the, the 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 folks are here occasionally and they're vaccinated. But yeah, it's uh, they don't they don't play anything more complicated than Century. Not entirely, because. Um, the, 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 the folks are here occasionally and they're vaccinated but yeah it's uh, they don't they don't play anything more complicated than century or the crew or Takedo, you know so we don't get to play those crunchy games how about you david uh, crunchy games is a good good point friends like one is uh, locally and the other one is like from my old hometown and both of them started uh, to play spirit island <laughs> So basically, I, I taught them how to play it via tabletop simulator, and that's yeah, it was a great success. We are playing like two or three times a week now. <laughs> great game, and it's a lot of fun because like they are not into no, they they are not into board games as much, like only like like settlers or similar. And but this time it's like they are really hooked, which is pretty cool to see. Uh, otherwise, I'm preparing the enemy within campaign for my Kara, for the time being at least. <laughs> uh, my my role playing group are moving close towards the climax of the first book. If if they can stop holding everything for, to their chest and <laughs> refusing to uh, do anything remotely risky. It's like all right, we've learned these things, what are we gonna do now? Uh, I don't know. And that adventure or campaign. Mm, yeah. I I love the two that follow it even more. Death on the Reich and Power Behind the Throne are just like some of the best role playing books ever written. So, yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, before we move on, I think. All right. Uh, before we move on, I think we do want to talk about the the elephant in the room, or or, or if you like it, the uh, whale in the sea, which is this insane container situation that's going on. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, uh, David, you, you have some experience of nautical things, don't you? Would you would you like to talk us a little bit on what's going what's going on from your yeah. drowning last week? Yes, yeah. <laughs> I recovered. I I think so at least. Um, yeah, basically, what happened? Like the container shipping rates, they increased up to uh, three hundred to five hundred percent, which is insane. Normally, like a race of like a year for shipping containers. And depending on the container, it's like, yeah, it's insane. Like if you have like, yeah, five times the price that you normally pay, that will be get very expensive. And that's really bad news for all the Kickstarters that, that uh, are going to get shipped soon or somewhere in, the, somewhere in the future. So that's going to be uh, not good. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Not only are all the Kickstarters fighting yeah. with each other to get shipping, but they're getting, um, obviously, everyone else, like the fashion industry is so, like, um, yeah, chucking yeah. to disarray, and they're um, just paying whatever they put, yeah, chucking yeah. to disarray, and they're um, just paying whatever they can get to get access to a container to get their stuff in time for shows and things. It's uh, it's pretty pretty crazy. And um, 
I think it, one thing to bear in mind is if you're following Kickstarters that are affected in this way, they couldn't have really foreseen this happening. Um, unless they be released, which is a different problem. Um, so be kind and polite to them when they say what's going on. But, you know, who knows? May it, will shop, shipping costs increase or will companies like be unable to deliver? Or um, will that, like will this end Kickstarter? Probably not, but it's, it's going to be a heck of a hit. I certainly think get everything done within six months at the moment. Um, yeah, yeah, just... It's, uh, it's, just to put things into perspective, like uh, let's say normally a shipping rate from uh, let's say from China to Europe would be like two thousand dollars, and now the price is fourteen thousand dollars for a single container. That's one. That's one container, yeah. Yeah, that's one container. Yeah, and typically a board game thing is what there, there got to be more than one container. Yeah, most of the time, yeah. That's yeah, that's it's... insane. It, it, it is. It's supply and demand, though. Isn't there a lot of problems with, like, ports? Or is it's supply and demand, though. Isn't there a lot of problems with, like, ports sort of, like, chopping and changing and shutting because of COVID things and, and all sorts? Yeah, a lot, a lot of, uh, let's say, a lot of uh, container vessels where, like, yeah, they had to drop anchor somewhere and just wait for new orders. They had to drop anchor somewhere and just wait for new orders. Because like um, the situation was unclear, which is always a very shitty situation most of the time for the sailors as well. Because like sometimes they have end of contract, which means they would go home soon, and if such an order comes, like it can mean that their contract soon, and if such an order comes, like it can mean that their contracts goes on and on and on for like six seven months at, on top of the time they normally stay, which is insane. So it puts a lot of strain on the all the sailors out there as well. Yeah, it's a rough time for everyone involved. So uh, be mindful that the uh, the people behind these Kickstarters, they want you to get your product. And they want you to get your product soon and have a good time with it. So they're, they're doing what they can. Yeah. Well, speaking of um, products, shall we talk about one that we uh, we played? We played yesterday. The Red Cathedral. The Red I keep Cathedral. calling it. I keep calling it Red Cathedral, but no, it's uh, the it's Red Cathedral. Great. Yes. Oh yeah, oh, right. I, I, now yeah. I see it. It's actually there. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> and it's yeah. even printed in red in the intro text. The yeah, Red Cathedral. Hidden away just above, certainly. So. Hidden away just above, certainly. So. Would you like to tell us all about this lovely game we played? Um, yeah, sure. So the Red Cathedral is a um, one to four player game by uh, Sheila Santos and Israel Centrero, I hope. Not sh Centrero, I hope. Not sure how to pronounce, pronounce the name to be uh, honest. I, I, th I think so. Centrero looks, looks about right. If Centrero. not... Uh, He's very welcome to email us if he ever hears this. And yeah. we don't have Alessio to uh, help us with the uh, the more Latin. Anyway, so um, in the game, um, it's about the um, process of building uh, Saint Basil's Cathedral in Moscow, and um, the players uh, are basically different teams of architects that work together to build this. Um, while doing so, of course, trying to give it their own touch and impressing the czar um, the most, so um, they get the most credit for it in the end, uh, no matter how much other people did. And um, yeah, so it on one hand has like a corporate part, everyone is works together to build this cathedral, but in the end, of course, it's about who impressed the most and has the most victory points or the most prestige in this case who builds the nicest plainest goldenest cross yes <laughs> and door like okay you build a tower but i put the cross on it <laughs> so huh yeah it's a um it's a rondel style game uh, very pretty and on your turn you'll be doing like one of three things you'll be um and on your turn you'll be doing like one of three things you'll be um gathering some resources from the rondel where you pick one of uh, the dice that's on the 
on there and you move it the number of spaces equal to the pips you'll do some abilities to gather resources the more dice in the space you've landed the more resources you get and then you re-roll all as you get and then you re-roll all of those dice in that space and the next person will have a go or you can take the lovely resources you've got and you can bring them over to the cathedral um, delivering three at a time to either construct something that you have claimed, I'm going to build this, and you put the scaffolding for, or as everybody came to really enjoy, everybody came to really enjoy to getting your lovely little decoration, your window, your door, your cross, and sticking some fancy gems in it and putting it on somebody else's hard-earned work and going, that's a nice bit of entrance you've made, but look at my door. <laughs> my door's amazing. Um, or you can claim, which typically is, or you can claim, which typically is actually the first action most people will do. I tried a different strategy when we played. It wasn't so hot. Maybe I should have just claimed. But that's where you pick one of the lowest sections that hasn't been claimed yet, put your flag on it, and say, I'm going to be building this piece, and then only you can contribute and build that bit of the tower. And then only you can contribute and build that bit of the tower. And it will... Um, You'll get a workshop tile that either you can pay for to get a special ability that upgrades one of your dice, or you put it face down and one of your dice just loses a special ability for the rest of the game. It's um, pretty cool. Game ends when somebody of the build, uh, of the cathedral, and then you score based on how fancy um, the completed sections are, who did the most work on them, and so on and so forth. It's a uh, it was interesting because when we played, it was a very quiet game. Like when it, it wasn't a lot of discussion to be doing on their next turn, uh, what would be best, and enjoying ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the sort of game where there's not that many interactions between player. Um, they can move the diet that would interest you and and get the resource that you were planning to get, which we were hoping to to claim or to that you had uh, you needed to build something else first, but it felt very um, self-focused, at least well, in my <laughs> Yeah, you see, the thing is, though, is that your game was concentrating almost entirely on building the single tallest tower. That is true. You, you chased me out of it, and I went and compete with a pretense. Um, <laughs> whereas elsewhere on the board, if you looked like um, Cara and I and Audrey and I and Audrey and Cara were all in hot competition to the point that Audrey, like, I was forced to build a plain... <laughs> plain cross and a plain door to ensure that I locked one of the towers in for scoring. It was the only tower I won. Like I got, I just got, like I got, I just got bits and pieces and all the rest. So I think maybe it was the way you were playing that um, made it feel more solo. Cause it was always, I always felt like I was racing to pick claims against uh, Cara and Audrey at every turn. And I was having to strategize and be like, okay, well, if this dice here is still here, I can get the brick I need. Guys would be like, okay, well, if this dice here is still here, I can get the brick I need. But what do I do if somebody else picks that because people keep taking brick? So I, I really felt like I was constantly fighting against everyone else um, by having to move earlier. Because I would have loved to have that, that plain gold cross I joked about. I wanted to stick gems on that. Audrey was going to step in there, stick her cross on there, and suddenly I would not be able to win the, the tower. I'd have to share the points, and I would have been <laughs> devastated. I would have I would have ended up last if I hadn't have put that stupid plain cross and that terrible undecorated decorated wooden door on that tower. And I really wanted to put them elsewhere. But, uh... It was not the smallest play, because in the end, I only claimed one tower instead of second place on other towers, which would actually have helped my uh, points a lot. Yeah. yeah. Kari, well, you were in a lot of towers, weren't you? And, and you did a lot yeah. of really nice decorations. Yeah, I did all my decorations. Yeah, I did all my decorations complete. So, um, yeah. I actually, I, I felt like yeah it's it's mostly focuses on on your own play but uh, first of all you have all these indirect um, interactions like these typical take all you have all these indirect um, interactions like these typical take that mechanics so haha i built what you wanted to build and um but also at the start of the game, I was very focused on what am I doing because I was still trying to. I was very focused on what am I doing because I was still trying to get around to okay, how does this work? What can I do? Um, 
like um, these things. And later I started to really look at other people's boards and for example, look, okay, I, I started to really look at other people's boards and for example, look, okay, I know you have this claim here above my scaffolding. So if you build this before I build mine, I will lose points. But do you have the resources for it? Do I have to build it now? Or can I do something else before um, I build? So I really felt like it's good to not only focus on your part. Yeah, it felt quite race-like at times and looking where you can cut your losses or delay on an action and got to push for others, um, which was quite interesting. At the beginning of the game, I was getting punished for not completing sections. Um, and then I looked and I went, well, you know what? If I just put a really fancy window in here, I can skip past three prestige levels and skip all of those points I would have lost, I have lost, and they don't even mean anything. So it ended up all the points punishment I took, which was just one point for enough. To, to get out of third place. Was it third or was I fourth? I don't know. I think I did, that you I did, were fourth. Uh, I, third. I, I, think, I think I was very close to, to your score, Alexis. But, uh, yeah, I think I was fourth. So. Yeah, yeah. Kara just smashed us, though, completely. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and Audrey did very well also. Although um, I, I took a look at the board state afterwards and um, uh, uh, they won because, you know, where I said you should put the window here. Um, that, was the dif <laughs> that was the difference between me being second and third and, and Audrey being second and third. It was those points there. So uh, ne never say I'm not willing to... So uh, ne never say I'm not willing to tell people what the right move is, even if it costs me <laughs> costs me my own position. But yeah, it's... Um, oh, I, I really liked it. I, I played it with Nijik as well, and as a two-player game, it, it felt very tight and crunchy and um, really head-to-head. Uh, -head head to head because you're you're genuinely just racing against one person so everything you're doing is affecting the person who's going after you constantly um so sometimes you're even taking dice that they would want um for the purpose of just being like ha ah, okay well now you're not getting the resources you want because none of the other dice take it here and then you run they get exactly what they need and you're like oh okay but yeah i am um, i am very impressed in this game um I gotta say as well, physically, they they knocked it out of the park. The game is gorgeous. It feels great. I love the artwork on the rondel, um, and also this box is small. like this box is um, the size of Mysterium Park, uh, so it's smaller than your typical Rio Grande, St. Petersburg, uh, Race for the Galaxy size box, and it's just completely full, which gets huge marks for me. Um, if, if you don't have any empty space inside your game and you're not bringing in um, not bringing in um, an expansion, I'm thrilled about it. I mean, you can have a nice insert, sure, but if your box is as small as possible, then uh, I'm a fan. <clears throat> yeah, it's always annoying if you buy like a game and then you look inside and there's like only like a few cards inside inside this massive box. <laughs> yeah. Inside this massive box. <laughs> Yeah, Ruins of Arnak, Lost Ruins of Arnak is a terrible culprit for that. Like, that box could be half the size, but we've talked about that in the past. Yeah. So. What I also liked about the game is um, in, in many of these games, I, I feel like there are turns. In many of these games, I, I feel like there are turns where you sit there and think, there's nothing useful I can do. And. I had no turn in this game where I felt that way. Sure, there were turns where I thought, okay, when I when it's my turn, I want to do this, and um, then and um, then Alexis took the die I wanted to take, and so I couldn't do it. And but there were still other options that made sense. Yeah. That's what I found was very interesting with the game is that it's very hard to completely lose a turn to anything. It's it's possible to have a turn that isn't as um, effective as it could be. Like, for example, when you had to put a, a very shitty cross on the top of that tower, uh, Fen. I but... love that cross. <laughs> <laughs> but more often than not... Um, you can always version for a turn and what happened most often on my end is that i had two or three turns planned and depending on the 
the board on the, the rotund, uh, I could do either moving towards my delivery or do the, the rotund that I, that I needed, or I could uh, put down a, a cross or, um, or a door that I had the resources for. It, it never felt like I, it never felt like I was wasting a turn, which often uh, happens in, in games like this, which I, I really enjoyed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you may think of like, um, I had several turns near the end where I basically banked my deliveries. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to deliver this stuff up here and I can do that and that's no problem, but I don't need to do it right now. I should concentrate on getting the other resources I'll need a bit further down the line and when the hold off and as long as I manage my resources and didn't get um, uh, too close to the limit of 10 which uh, by the end um, it, it worked lovely to, to effectively bank short actions and be like yes I know what I'm doing at this point I will say I don't think I upgraded my dice very well um, they didn't do much um, they didn't do much for me throughout the entire game I genuinely think the ones that give you access to um, another dice's payment seemed to just be a little bit more useful um, but that could have just been the particular workshops we had land out through the entire thing through the entire thing so uh, yeah yeah th that's also something that i think is interesting is that there's like a fair element of randomization onto the board that means that depending on uh how things are laid down uh, the, the the best strategy for the game can be what uh, we had when we played and yes. i think that's i think that's pretty good because in games like this there's usually a lot of replayability quote unquote because you're going to play with different people or you are going to master your strategy or to learn more about the game but in this one specifically the strategy will always be different and while there's definitely certain true lines it does feel like you um, you have to adapt yourself to the board, which I find is, is pretty pretty interesting. Like we had a, for example, one very strong card that allowed you to pay one to do a, an immediate one delivery. One very strong card that allowed you to pay one to do a, an immediate one delivery, and it was on a corner of the the rotten that it was a little bit less useful, but maybe. Um, it was very much worth uh, going there just to get a little advance and some resources that were going there just to get a little advance and some resources that was, was maybe less interesting but still uh, get uh, a very small delivery that might allow you to do a better one later. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, let's uh, let's just send some thumbs up and uh, a last oh, yeah. standy salute for sure. Big recommendation, yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to go from the um, wonderful religious heights of a, a, a cathedral now to a particularly, well, almost the opposite, really. So, Alexis, would you like to talk to us all about Dungeon Degenerates? Uh, which is a very long title and a game that probably nobody knows about because it is made by a very small company uh, called Goblin Co. Uh, I think that they are in the US. Uh, the game is kind of made at home and not in large quantities, so it's expensive than it should, and the materials are, are a little bit shoddy. And for a while, I've been uh, mulling over recommending it because I adore the game on principle, but I have a lot of little caveats in the game here and there, and many people will uh, try the game and be completely uh, completely pushed away from it because of its art style or because of the way it plays or because of the cost or because of the uh, material. But I think that if you are interested, it's definitely worth uh, having a look. There's a, um, a similar to a version, so uh, I would uh, recommend anybody to, to give it a try there. Um, so basically, uh, Dungeon Degenerates is a cooperative RPG light exploration game. The basic loop of the game is moving around the map of the uh, I, I'm uh, the War Strike, War Strike, the Sausage Reich, is the the name in in German. 
<laughs> uh, I, my pronunciation is not going to be good for that one. Um, you fight monster and you try to accomplish a mission that come in a scenario book. Every aspect of the game, a dungeon regenerate stands out by being different from any other game in its category. A difference sometimes in great ways, uh, like the combat or the, the way that the mission functions, sometimes in a way that will uh, push people away from it. Uh, first of all, and I mentioned that in our podcast, uh, the visual style of the game is really striking. It has a very strong 70s or 80s art style. Um, it also mimics the color coding of early, 17, uh, or early 70s uh, RPG designs. Printing cost at the time, they often had a limited palette of uh, less used color to use. And Dungeon Regenerate similarly uses the most visually aggressive colors, uh, puke yellow, blister green, vomit magenta, um, and they use it in interesting ways. For example, each region of the game has two or three colors, and each monster of that region will have the same color palette. So you always have that very strong identity to each region of the map. Have you have you have had a look at the at the art style? Uh, yes, I, I have. It's very. <laughs> it is very. That is. <laughs> yeah. That is perfect. It is very. <laughs> like. The art style reminds me of like some of those seventy rock rocks rock rock yeah. uh, long plays uh, players my dad used to own. <laughs> yes, um, it has a very um, uh, what's the name of it again? Uh, Metal Hurlant. Uh, name of it again? Uh, Metal Hurlant, uh, the French magazine uh, of the rock from the seventies. How do you, how have you had a look of the art style fan and what do you think about it? Um, I have. I I kind fan and what do you think about it? Um, I have. I I kind of like it. It's shonky and like grubby and messy and very low lo fi in a in a cool, cool fashion. Yes. Um, and I was it um, and I was it. I was reminded of. Um, I have one of these. Uh, the the really silly series, Epic Spell Wars of the Battle Wizards. I have Duel at Mount Skullfires. That yeah. same kind of um, cartoonish, over the top, like um, rough and free sort of um, rough and free sort of style. Um, yeah, that's one of the things that caught my eye most of all. And the the big giant hand of doom miniature. Yeah, um, yeah, it's good to to mention that also. They they have a few miniatures that came within the with the Kickstarter, and they are made in that in the with the Kickstarter, and they are made in that metal Peter type uh, style that is very oldies and kind of low quality, but it's a chunky bit of metal that feels pretty neat. Uh, once painted, they can look they can look quite good. As a fan just posted on or as a fan just posted on our uh, chat that none of your listener will see, but uh, <laughs> it will probably be on the Discord. Yeah, well, they, the chat can, all, you know, people yeah, listening yeah. can always have a, a look at the Dungeon yeah. Degenerates Hand of Doom entry to see the, the models. They're very yes. 1980s, um, in this case. I like the character of them, but I think these could have been executed better. However, yeah. I've just seen this fishoid guy with a pile of jelly and some like mm-hmm. newts around his neck and i kind of love that model they look really good um i think that's it's a good place as any by a tiny indie company and so the problem is that the component of the game are not great there it's mostly a ca- cardboard uh, and the cardboard is all right but if you play with the metal miniature you're going to leave indentation on the map for example which is kind of a shame um everything that comes from a punch board take out very uh carefully because it's extremely easy um to like rip the uh the the colors on top and to have like a, a badly punched out um standee which again uh kind of sucks and uh fan you're going to die inside 
Don't, when we talked about inserts, if you're not going to have a good insert, don't have one at all. Yeah, is, is my position. I'm yes. I'm fine with that. Like Red Cathedral has no insert, and I'm absolutely okay with it. I just hate it when they're those terrible plastic inserts that you're like, great, this plastic hardly ever recycles and it's useless. That's true. Uh, w- uh, miniatures, the the tiny white boxes, and I uh, basically lay them down into my dungeon generate. Uh, box to use as uh, dividers. That well, seems like a good use for them. I just yeah. recycle those. Yeah, very, very good use uh, uh, for them. And I use a lot of um, uh, the bands to, to keep the the cards uh, separate. Ooh, no, no, no. Rubber bands on cards, especially if it's thin cardboard, unless they're sleeved, you shouldn't be doing they, that. They are sleeved, mine. Um, All right, then maybe yeah. it's okay, but I would still be looking at um, putting them in a baggie or maybe even a deck box. Yeah, it it would probably be best in or maybe even a deck box. Yeah, it it would probably be best in the in the long term. Yeah. Um so yeah, as the art style sets it apart from any other game, it's also something that will stop a lot of people from ever touching the game. Uh I can definitely see why someone would just look at the box and be like, Yep, not for me. <laughs> I can definitely see why someone would just look at the box and be like, Yep, not for me. <laughs> I I I I guess I I looked at it and went ooh yeah exactly it, it's going to be a very uh, either you you love it or you hate it uh, it's that kind of of art style uh, and here and there it also uh, it's that kind of of art style uh, and here and there it also holds the gameplay a little bit uh, the map's artwork is beautifully horrible. Uh, but a lot of information is often confusing to read out. For example, there's two different types of road on the map, and uh, they are differentiated by uh, they are differentiated by the um, color scheme that they adopt. Uh, but because the colors are sometimes confusing, uh, sometimes I had to frown and stare at the map trying to figure out which travel uh, rules I could use. Um, but some really great aspect. For example, um, the with the game you have a campaign book which gives you quests to do. You can either pick yep. one and, and just yep. do that quest. I, yeah. I looked. I saw there was one which was a quest for sausage or something. Yes. Uh, the, <laughs> I love it. I love every, it. Every quest is really fun. Um, but the, the quest you will have different um, goals, and depending on which goal you fulfill, you are going to move on to a different quest. So there's like a uh, sort of the the campaign that you're going to experience is uh, going to be non-linear. It's going to be depending on what you do. Most of the game, you have a shady guy that asks you, that gives you the head of a soothsayer uh, and asks you to go onto a market and sell it to his cousin. That's basically the mission that you have. But uh, the, the head of the, the self-sayer that you have tells you that you can also just to uh, give it back to its um, the, the village it comes from. And if you if you do that, you're going to move on to a different quest line. But uh, you can also just say, fuck that, uh, sell the self-sayer head to any shop in the game and use that money to move on to ours you to have a, a lot of funds to to start uh to start off early and depending on the quest that you can do you're going to have a completely different uh, few more quests and so i think that to finish the main campaign it takes i'm going to say roughly 20 hours but there's a lot of variation to that. it's it's very interesting um and you can also finish them in in very different ways for example um one quest uh, requires you to chase a caravan that is moving through uh, a specific part of the land. And to do that, you need to encounter a seventh card. But there are uh, some items that allow you to pick a specific event card. So you can, as a side quest, go and get that item kind of organically. And there's a lot of little elements like this that I think make this game just a little bit more than something from a quality usually is like it, it just goes a little bit ahead and i would love to see dungeon generate made with um maybe a little bit more polish maybe a little bit more money maybe a little bit more to itself but it, it 
I would definitely recommend the other game that can be rough around the edges. Yeah, um, isn't this the third Kickstarter printing for it? Wasn't it recently? That's why I'm reading on a little a sticker or something. It's it's twenty a 2017 game. Originally. Yes, I yeah. think it. I think it has. I know that definitely had two Kickstarter. Might have uh, had two Kickstarter. Might have uh, had a third, but I didn't look into the third one. Oh yeah, uh, there's a, st- it's a little note thing here that says thanks for backing the Dungeon Degenerates Hand of Doom third printing Kickstarter. So it must then then it's must the third. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I really like um, adventure games, um, and we're not going to have time to talk adventure games, um, and we're not going to have time to talk about it, but uh, I was playing one last week called Destinies, um, which is also an adventure game, uh, but a competitive one. I I probably will bring it up for talking about um, maybe next podcast, because I think it's an interesting one to talk about, uh, at least one to talk about, uh, at least um, in the intro section. But uh, this this is this is looking like it's doing a lot of things that those traditional move around the board, have an adventure type things do, but really putting a lot of unusual, innovative spins on it. Yes. With this weird 1980s aesthetic, I think it's the only 1980s aesthetic. I think it's the only way to describe it. It's a very 1980s Games Workshop cartoon style. Yeah. If you've ever seen an old copy of White Dwarf, they have artwork similar to this in like, what's his name? Hang on, hang on, I know this. Thread the Barbarian <laughs> and things like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm pleased I remember. To, uh, to highlight with this game, uh, first of all, the lore on it is really fun. Uh, in the game itself, you uh, don't have too much. You have a lot of things in the, the cards and the description and the, the different monster that you encounter, but on top of that, you also have uh, a Dungeon Dragon Wait website. They sell those little uh, zines that are tiny little uh, bits of play- paper that are just law book about this board game, and that will just explain to you like how uh, the sausage war uh, happened or what's <laughs> the deal with those weird. Fi- um, and it's always interesting. For example, the the fishered people they have a religion, and the symbol of that religion is uh, a lure because uh, their messiah was fished by someone. <laughs> I think it's great. Um, we can also mention the um, head of the project, uh, whose name is uh, Sir Sean uh, Sean Sean Arberg. Ar- Sean Arberg yeah. I think. Or He's Arberg, maybe. Yeah. He's the artist behind the game. He's also the, the head of the project, and he's the head of Koblinko, which is that tiny company that is extremely punk. He's an old-style uh, 70s, the kind of guy that was uh, hanging out in bars with the leather jackets and beating up na- Nazis in the in the 60s. Like he's very much a strange dude, but he he got um he got he got his own style. Yeah, um, he he looks like quite an unusual character. Yes. Um, and uh, certainly a big sense of humor about himself uh, and what he does. Uh, yeah. I, I, it's beginning to make sense now. Like the, I, I'm pretty sure he sculpted the models. Yes. For, he did. F- for miniatures, so everything ties together quite, uh, yeah. quite nicely. Uh, this is a this quite. Uh, yeah. Quite nicely. Uh, this is a, this is like um, it reminds me of Ryan Lockett and Tim Fowers in that this is like somebody's vision and project and they've brought it all to life and um, and got it out there with people. Uh, you could, I think we could call him an auteur. Definitely. I, I'm going to. Uh, this is a bit of a tangent, but during the second Kickstarter, he had um, uh, in French we call that an AVC, like a, a brain um, aneurysm. Um, mm. Is that it? Yeah. Uh, very. Yeah, um, yeah a, a stroke. Is yeah. Here. yeah. Very rough, but he managed to pull. The Kickstarter was a. The Kickstarter delivery was a bit delayed, but it was. There was like a lot of uh, support for him. Uh, I think that it adds a little bit to the game that it's this personal project and that he, he you know, he. It kind of helped him recovering because it was such a big team recovering because it was such a big focus in his uh, in his life and I don't know I, I think that it adds a little bit that it's just such a personal thing to him um, if you yeah I, I think it's uh, very 
interesting in that part. Um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, very interesting in that part. Um, I'll, I'll just add uh, one last little thing because it. I don't usually talk too much about specific game mechanics, um, but I think that the way the combat function, the combat functions in uh, Dungeon Degenerates, is worth rates is worth mentioning because it feels so smooth and nice to me and I wish more games did something a little bit more like this. So when you encounter monster, they will uh, target a uh, different player depending on the stats of those players. So for example, they will target the um, slowest character in the group or the strongest or uh, the one uh, morale. Um, and then each, uh, each player will uh, on their turn roll five dice, two green, two red and one purple. Uh, they can decide if they are either in an aggressive or defensive stance, and whichever they pick will put the purple die into uh, as a replacement die for pool or the green pool. Uh, then they compile their uh, each pool with the stats that they use for attack or defense, uh, depending on their gear. And as long as they roll under that stat, the IS die will do um, will be used to do the attack or the defense on their turn. And so the way this goes, you just your stats, assign damage, and then you move on to the next turn. And it just feels so sharp and quick. I really like, I enjoy that. I think that the game um, is, was kind of made away from other board game, and so it doesn't really replicate too much of currently done in uh, games of the same ilk of like exploration adventure type games. And because of that, there's just that strange um, one-of-a-kind type uh, energy to to a lot of it. And I think that just for that, if the artwork, uh, if you don't mind the artwork too much, and if you can find it for not too uh, expensive with the the shipping cost, maybe it's worth having a look. Yeah. Well, I'll, um, I I I think this is pretty pretty interesting. Um... <clears throat> definitely the kind of thing now that we're done with uh, Dungeon to Return it and, and wrap up I think it's also important to point out that we got a new Patreon ooh thanks hooray welcome to the the punch board <laughs> uh, yes and uh, I think that all new Patreon is uh, Christian yeah uh, I hope I'm come to the, the last Andy and I hope that you enjoy the show I hope we can bring pleasure to your ears <laughs> I hope I made it awkward enough then yeah, well, welcome, and to everyone else who listens, we appreciate uh, we appreciate all of you. Uh, it's it's nice to talk to you, even if we can't hear you talk back. Maybe that's the best thing because we do say some stupid stuff. You talk back. Maybe that's the best thing because we do say some stupid stuff at times. <laughs> but yeah, well, and that would bring us to the end of our episode, and that's all we have time for. So you can catch us over at www patreon.com forward slash the last standee to ease or standee to ease or as the last standee on twitter so until next time we have been the last standee goodbye from alexis from belgium au revoir goodbye from david bye goodbye from cara bye goodbye from my soul ecclesiastical <laughs>